put the fear aside. Everybody's got their own struggle. And that's the beauty of the yoga class, because you go in there and everybody has their own struggle in class. There's no perfect yogi. So our guest today is an old friend and former co-worker, Tom Strachan. I met Tom in the fall of 2000 when I joined Akamai Technologies as an account manager. And anyhow, I'm grateful for Tom for several reasons. One is, and the most important is, he got me into yoga. His practice, his dedication to Bikram back then, and his enthusiasm that brought along so many of his coworkers is the reason why I got into yoga. I don't still practice Bikram, but anyhow, that was the door that got me into this amazing path. And so I'm appreciative for Tom for doing that. And I'm also grateful that he's joining us today to share his story about his path with yoga and also his challenges with alcoholism. And I just really, really appreciate him being so open and him being so generous with his story and how yoga has helped. So we talk quite a bit about Bikram. We talk quite a bit about just the benefits that yoga has mentally, physically, and spiritually. And anyhow, you're going to like Tom. You're going to enjoy this podcast. And thanks again for listening. Tom Strachan, great to have you, and thanks for joining us. Yeah, really excited to be here, Derek. Glad to reconnect with you, and also this is a topic that is near and dear to me, so really excited to be here. Well, this is an interview I've looked forward to for a long time because it was at Akamai 20 years ago that I got into yoga. I remember our office was in Cambridge. I don't remember which floor we were on. We were sitting amongst the sales teams and all the account guys and I don't know if it was Vatalero or Cameron came over to me, or maybe it was you and said, a bunch of us are going to a yoga class. Would you, would you like to go to, to yoga? And I'm thinking, I don't even know what yoga is. And I'd heard of it. I think probably like other people, I was just like, well, maybe it's some chanting and whatever. And so I didn't have a lot to go on. And I do remember somebody was like, this is a Bikram class and it's going to be a little hot and you may not want to eat much before class. And I think I took that advice pretty well. I, I may have had a few uh, handfuls of Camerons of like wasabi peas, which is probably something I wouldn't do before a Bikram class again. But <laughs> either way, it was a memorable intro to yoga. And so it's great having uh, this conversation with you because you were a part of those. I mean, you were because I think everyone was influenced by your yoga path and your then girlfriend, now wife's role as a teacher then. And so you, you, you probably got me into yoga. So it's awesome to have you here. So thanks again. Yeah, it's a wonderful story because you never know how you're going to influence somebody's life. And it's like those small moments, like that all encapsulates one moment in your life that I happen to be really into yoga. And then I, I met Patrick, obviously. And we were both sort of akin to that. And as you know, he was like super athletic person. So it fit for him. But yeah, no, I'm so glad to hear that. And it's like such a meaningful moment. And like you, I have so many Akamai connections. But at that time, yoga was big in my, in my life. And I was probably two and a half years into it at that point. So my journey started well before that. And it was well in play at Akamai just because of the corporate culture and obviously the stress being a, a venture-backed startup at the time. So it was great. And it was great to build that community of other colleagues who wanted to do that. So I joined Akamai in the fall of 2000. So you got into yoga in the late 90s. Were, were you also part of the pre-IPO team? Because I def there definitely was a group at yeah. Akamai that I also noticed were the pre, pre-IPO group who was sort of like yeah. ad admired from across the cubes. But just back us it's up strange, a little bit. Right? <laughs> back us up a little bit. You got into yoga before Akamai or you had already... You before, yeah. I'll go all the way back. So I grew up in a family where like alcohol was really prevalent. And right. my father, I, I didn't understand alcoholism. It was like classic Irish family. Dad came home from work, would start drinking. And I was like, okay, normal behavior because right. I didn't know any any other behavior. But also what I did start to recognize was like there was this stress building in that drinking within the family. Dad was a, he drank in private and would end up asleep on the couch. But what it led to was a lot of anxiety, a lot of nerves. And yep. that led me down the path. And I think anybody who's studied alcoholism 
there's a predisposition towards it within the family circle. Genetic or just or just the cultural thing too? It's, it's the cultural, it's the genetics, it's the predisposition, it's the environment. And it all leads to sort of, I think, triggering the behavior in others and certainly well prevalent in the family. And it did sort of trigger this response to the stress and anxiety. So... I can remember as early as eighth grade, like taking NyQuil to fall asleep. So like that, that addiction in me was wow. like there from the beginning. Yeah. And that set off years of drinking to deal with anxiety, stress, everything else that, that comes with life. And over time, the addict, it doesn't work anymore, right? You end up dead in jail or in recovery. And thankfully, fast forward. So I wasn't like, there were no really big events that had occurred in my life, right? Like I was a functioning alcoholic, so to speak. I'd gotten into business school. I was at my first semester in business school and we had a set of teammates and I had chosen... One of the things you do in business school is you build a business plan around something and then you present it in your first half to the rest of your classmates. And Mm -hmm. as like a good alcoholic, I convinced the team to do a wine store. And what I found was... I was, I was going to say, you, you took it right to the tavern. Let's go brainstorm at the tavern because there's a great whiteboard down at O'Callahan's. Yeah, it was perfect. And I picked wine because it seemed to have a more elegant sure. feel to it. Yeah. Luxury brand. So I was living in Brookline, Massachusetts. And what I found was like every evening I was going to Trader Joe's to buy Argentinian wine, right? And I was also smoking, right? And like at the surface, my roommate would joke with me like, geez, you like drink every night. But I was like, oh, it's, I'm not drinking every night. It's just a cocktail. Anyhow, right. we get to the end of the business plan. And what I noticed was after we presented, like I kept drinking and I wanted to go, go, go while my classmates were sort of like had a sip of it. And we're like, oh, we're tired. We're going home. We're going to do yeah. something healthy. So that was the first moment where I thought something was wrong. And the timing was interesting. I went to visit my parents in Florida. My dad was having some episodes, like we had to call the ambulance and that had reached sort of the crux of like the stress, anxiety. And I went to a bookstore and I found a book called, I'm sorry, I'm talking about alcoholism, but it leads no, to- No, no, this is great. I, this is, I appreciate it actually. This is great. I bought a book called The Family Diseased. I read it. I'm like, oh my gosh, it's diseased and this is the roadmap. And so one thing led to another. We hired an interventionist for my father. And the end result of that was I got sober. So I came back to business school that following January after doing this intervention with my father. And there were so many new experiences not being able to go and grab a drink. And at that point, you start leading down this healthier path and start going to meetings. And at that point, I think somebody had mentioned yoga, like, hey, calm the mind. It's a healthy activity. So I actually got involved, I believe it was 1997, and I was at the at a gym in Alston, I think it's now the Boston Athletic Club, and they had a yoga class at like 6.30 in the morning with a guy named Menelik. And I was living with another roommate, and he knew my story, was so supportive of me. I can't thank him enough. His name is Doug Rothstein, and I ended up going to the class, and I like From that moment, what I saw in the instructor, he was uh, a male electrician in Boston, probably in his late 50s, and had never seen anybody in better shape with more flexibility and more peace. This was the instructor? Yeah. This was early. This was before Lululemon. Yoga was starting to come of age, right? And so I started practicing very seriously. I I think it it was offered like two days a week and I would go and I would practice and it was awesome. And then... By the way, so this was a studio in Alston. Do you remember the type of yoga they were doing there? So it wasn't a studio, it was a gym. It was a gym, right, right. Terrible environment, no windows, (laughs) big. They did it in the basketball room in the gym. And so, so very open. And he would just bring us through a set of stretches that he had put together. So it's really Menelik's sort of own practice that yeah. he brought to all of us. Well, does that look like what yoga was now? Or Because I had a recent conversation with a guy who got into yoga in the 90s and he said it was sort of like 
it was yoga, but it was more stretching and movement too. Was was your impression that this, he was actually kind of doing a real yoga class or he had kind of created something that fit what he was trying to achieve? I think he created something that he created to fit what he wanted to achieve. So there's a little bit of some movement in the beginning that yep. wouldn't, you wouldn't see like with a traditional Ashtanga class, but it was definitely yoga, like breath, hold the posture, but it was definitely his sequence. So it wasn't under one of the specific practices that are well known today, like right. Ashtanga or Iyengar or whatever it might be. So it was definitely his own, but it was very much a yoga practice. At the end, we'd all lay in Svasana. He would come around and, and stretch our legs. And so it had the components of a traditional yoga class. So yep. Yep. Uh, most definitely. By the way, before you move on, one thing I want to point out is like, like yoga can be all kinds of different things. It doesn't have to be a certain traditional form. It doesn't have to be a certain style. It doesn't have to be in a certain room. And I think what I appreciate about that story is that this is a guy who found something that works for him and he put some intention and thought into it and wanted to share it with others. So those who are listening, it's like, it doesn't have to really look like yoga to be yoga. And as long as you're getting some benefits from it and you're building on it. Yeah. so. Then he had, keep rolling. Yeah, and from there, I had another friend who was actually also in recovery and uh, connected with him on the Cape. And he had become friends with Baron Baptiste and he came from an interesting family and anyhow was helping Baron come to Cambridge. So I was doing metallix classes and then I started to augment it with Baron Baptiste and that practice. And then that took me to another level because Baron would have the heat it was sort of the Ashtanga type practice. The yoga studio would get packed, but it still sort of was like I was hooked. And the thing that it was giving me when you think about the earlier part around the alcoholism, right? Like I'd stopped drinking every night. It was like, what was I doing? And then I had all these feelings and emotions and anxiety of doing everything for the first time sober. Not that I was drunk 24 hours a day, but... Right. With like speaking in front of the class at business school, ton of anxiety. But what I found was like in sobriety with yoga, with the right mindset, with the breathing, being able to use those tools, I was actually a decent public speaker. And it became less of an issue for me. And being sober and, and starting to have more of a mindful awareness around me, I started yeah. to notice that everybody sort of dealt with a level of anxiety. I just didn't have the tools and I had this extra level of sort of tumult, like stress that occurred in my earlier life that I was dealing with and sort of had to cleanse. So as I moved through that journey, I, I found the heat that was really nice. And it sort of felt like I was removing toxins and stress that had accumulated over the 27 years that I was alive. And plus, I liked the fact that I was now like able to do something in the evening that was healthy and enjoyable. And... It also gave me that dopamine lift, right? Like the thing that I was searching for, I think, by using alcohol or whatever, right? That joy. Like I can't remember ever coming out of a yoga class and happy, right? Maybe going there, being like, oh gosh, I can't deal with this. I don't want to do it. Unless you eat wasabi peas before the <laughs> class, you're not yeah. as happy after the class. Yeah, but you probably even felt better somehow, some way. So that was the early journey. And then I finished business school and I moved to San Francisco and I was out there alone working for a software company and I had nothing else to do. And I was looking for a yoga studio. And at the time, Bikram Yoga was sort of the big thing. I had never heard about it. And yeah. there was Bikram Yoga Studio right near where I worked in Nevada, California. And I started going there and then I got immediately hooked on that. Like there, the simplicity of the sequence, the heat. Every time I came out of there, I felt like a million bucks, ton of energy. I also started to refine my eating, like moving a little bit more towards like plant-based, more healthier yeah. eating. And I got so hooked to it and had nothing better to do, honestly, no social life, like I was doing it twice a day. And I was in San Francisco for about nine months. And then I heard of Akamai and that's what brought me back. This is 98, 98, 99. Yeah, yep. So yep. I moved back, I think, 
the summer of 98 and got the job at Akamai in the fall, like September of 98. I actually applied from California, got the interview, quit my job, moved back and ended up getting the job at Akamai. Yeah. And so the biggest stress about taking the job at Akamai was like, where was I going to do yoga? <laughs> and at that time, I was dating Orin, who you mentioned earlier, my girlfriend, and she had rheumatoid arthritis. So as we we're dating, I, I was bringing her to Bikram and while I was at Akamai, she decided to go to Bikram's training for two months. Like the sequence, she yeah. got attracted to it. And we were going to a woman's studio in Roxbury or in that area named hey. Diane Ducharme. And she was sort of the first Bikram yoga teacher in Massachusetts. Hey, let me just jump in for one second. For those who are listening who haven't had the pleasure of doing Bikram and sweating out five pounds or 10 pounds of sweat in a Bikram class... Can you just give those who are listening a quick kind of highlight of what Bikram is or what is Bikram yoga and, and just give them that reference? Yeah, absolutely. So Bikram, who is now a little bit infamous, he got in trouble with the law of sexual harassment. And it's not the Bikram that I experienced, but understand like totally serious allegations and his whole sort of name has been ruined. But the Bikram method was 26 postures. You do two postures and the sequence is the same every time. And it's done in a 95 to 100 degree room. So the heat is very intense. You start to sweat right away. But the nice thing about that is for beginners, you start to see your progress very quickly over a period of months because you're doing the same postures. And then right. there's also a lot of predictability. So you come in you know, to expect what you're going to do. So it became very easy to adapt. And I ended up liking it better than what I experienced at Baron Baptiste because Baron's was very free flow. And it was like, how do I track my progress? And every class is different. Every teacher is sort of different. So I, I really got attracted to the... It's yeah. like the Steve Jobs approach to clothing, like put on the same clothing every day. Beacom was that for me at the time. And it gave me the peace, the calmness, after a stressful day of work, it was gone. And right. what I loved about Bikram, to get through that class, I was in the moment, right? So every, every posture, I wanted to do my best. There was nothing else going in my mind. And if something had entered, like I had a crazy day, it would soon be removed as I went through the posture. So where others might go run or bike, like yoga was doing both sort of bringing me back to the moment and providing a ton of other benefits as I went through it. Right. And I don't do Bikram much now anymore yeah. just because I find that it, there's just too many electrolytes lost. It's super hard on the body, especially in my 40s. But but I will say, like, you have to be paying attention in Bikram class because you can't really zone out, but you get a chance to totally zone out at the very end when you're lying on the mat. And then yeah. you get to really enjoy Shavasana at the end. But I loved the physicality of Bikram. Like you said, the consistency. And knowing how to build on what you did last time, the heat felt great and I loved it. But I want to sort of honor your story and go back to where you were talking about Diane being yeah. one of the first teachers in Boston. So let's go back there. Yeah. So Diane was great, like super friendly, Bikram class, knew what to expect. And she was a great guide in the beginning for Bikram. And she helped my wife make the decision about going to training and doing all of those things. So Diane was great. My first teacher was Menelik. And then I started to get influenced. To your point, I would do a Bikram class, but I'm not a regular practitioner. I got burnt out by it. Yeah. And then also part of my stories, you know, and we, we may get to, like we ended up after the Akamai career and 9-11 and all those things, I went into business with my wife and we owned two Bikram yoga studios in Boston. And the business aspect of yoga took the fun out of it for me. Right. And after those three years ended, I was sort of like done with Bikram. And we actually moved to Naples and I started doing another yoga practice with different type of teachers. And always through my Bikram... While well, we own the studio, I, I practice with people like Dharma Mitri, David Swenson, so Patricia Walden, Iyengar. So I was always open-minded to a lot of different practices as I still am today. Like it's not one size fits all for me anymore. And I don't think it ever was, right? Like 
even when I was living in San Francisco, I got into Bikram. I used to complement that with a slower, colder practice where it's more meditative and you held the postures a bit longer. And yeah, so at the end of the day, Bikram was an influence. I was attracted to that particular sequence at the time because it like fit the need of the beginner and the heat I really loved. But I've continued to explore and my practice now is definitely not at all Bikram. We talked a little bit about how I fell off. It's not that I stopped doing yoga, I think. Like yoga is always there for me. It's always this like grounding place to go back to, whether it's like the influence of music from yoga, like Krishna Das. Like I I was listening to that the other day on my bike ride on the Gulf of Mexico because I'm down in Naples right now in Florida. And being able to stop, breathe, and even stretch for a moment with my breath to me, is still my yoga practice. So there's been less of an influence of like a class and more of like, how do I incorporate it daily? But there has been a period, I'd say, over probably the last three or four years where I stopped going to yoga altogether. And that's been less a function of the yoga and more of a function of moving some jobs, continuing to be sort of in this corporate mentality And then with COVID over the last, uh, gosh, how long has it been? Like 15 months or so now? It's like, I've literally been stuck at home. And when you reach out to me about this this podcast, I happen to be in Florida. My wife said, go to Florida, get healthy, get outside and exercise. And as I've started to exercise more, like I'm playing tennis in the morning, I'm biking in the evenings, my body actually has gone back to needing, wanting, and craving yoga. So... I want to thank you, one, because I'm actually doing yoga before I play tennis at a park in the morning outside, like doing a little bit of the shtanga practice and then actually using some props. Like I'm doing it at a playground. So I'm I'm using the bars and everything else to help with the back and some stretches as, you know, I started yoga at 27, I'm now 51. And so the help of a prop is not a bad thing. And what I found though is it always comes back to the breath, right? Like yeah, it totally does. in and out through the nose. And that's what always brings me back to the moment. And that's why I love the yoga practice so much. Yeah, no, I'm with you. And I think you hit on a good point. Like we like having a routine. We like having just the way, and when we start a new job or we move to a different town or a hundred year pandemic arrives, our routines get thrown off. And I think a lot of people probably thrive more in their yoga practice at a studio because, right, they motivate to go there. They get there. There's no distractions. A teacher takes them through a class. And if they don't have access to that class, or let's say they don't leave the house early enough, or they get to the class and it's just packed and they're like, they're not even checked in yet and they can tell there's going to be no room. And that's their thing where they want a certain amount of space. When they don't have that regular routine, it's easy to fall out of yoga. And I think one of the things about COVID that's been helpful for me is really being a focus on my own home practice and figuring out maybe it's not every day. Maybe I try to do a little bit every day, but maybe it's watching an app, one of the yoga apps or watching something on YouTube, or maybe you get to a studio and you're right. Like when you get thrown out of routine, it sort of drops out. But if you have enough of a practice, you can kind of do yoga anywhere. Like you can do it. Yeah. If you're stuck at the airport gate, you can be that guy <laughs> over on the wall towards the men's room or whatever, and just stretching out maybe your back or whatever. And I think you start to realize that you sense more. It's not so much that it's Sunday, nine o'clock. I have to get to the studio class. It's more like, well, my hamstrings are tight or my back's tight and I need to do something. And so you kind of have a better sense of awareness. The other thing you mentioned about where it fits into you, your life, as far as preparing you for tennis. I mean, I, I play hockey once or twice a week and I usually will do a little bit of yoga to kind of wake up the body. Not so much like a muscle warm up, but just to make sure that I'm a little tuned in because if I catch an egg on the ice or there's a collision, like I just want to be a little bit quicker, be a microsecond quicker to, to react to that. And if I don't do a little bit of warm up before an athletic activity, I just think I set myself up for more risk. So I, so I totally hear you, especially as I get older. Yeah, I mean, the benefits are abound. And I think as I think about the the story, right, and what we talked about, it's like addiction is so tied to my yoga practice, as funny as that is, because 
as an addict, right? Like you never, so yeah, I stopped drinking, but then food becomes an issue, right? Or Mm -hmm. whatever the next thing is. And there are elements to addiction and resources that I have at my fingertips, but I found, and I think my success in recovery, I'll be 20 years sober, knock on wood, in January. And part of that success was, you know, I'd go to these meetings and people would be like smoking and drinking coffee and they'd be feeding us donuts. And and that's all of the part of Alcoholics Anonymous, right? Right. And I would look around and I'm like, and and it's it's not judgmental and, and it has a place, right? Because people are coming off of like some very difficult things and it's a coping mechanism and it's a way as unhealthy as it might be a way to cope but what i found soon enough was like i needed to never like get away from alcoholics anonymous a big supporter but find something to augment that and yoga has become that opportunity for mindfulness and yeah, it's so funny. Like you were just talking about it. It might be something where you look at a YouTube video to ground yourself. And for me, that might be the case. It might be actually just looking at a practice. I might not be practicing, but it, it's like, okay, I need to go back to something that's healthy, that I love, that energizes me. So I'll often listen to, like I said, the music or Asad Guru is somebody I like to listen to now. He's a Indian yogi. I don't know if you've heard of him, but he's very much around the message of mindfulness. And like you said, most people would say that actually yoga is not like the physical practice is to get you to the meditative practice. Yep. And I do truly believe that. And it's opened up my mind when I am stressful to say time out. It doesn't have to necessarily be a physical practice, but what am I going to do to bring myself back to grounding myself. And if you call that yoga, then I'm doing yoga all the time, every day. Yeah. It's in the background. It's just like I said on another podcast, or I commented on a previous interview about how I'm getting much better at reacting, understanding my mind or reaction when I'm upset or annoyed or frustrated with something. But I'm also equally getting sort of more aware of even when you're in an excited, good mood, just how to kind of just ground it a little bit so you don't do something impulsive just because you're in a great mood or whatever. And it sounds a little bit like counterintuitive, but it's really about just staying kind of in the middle, just kind of grounding yourself, trying to stay sort of 72 degrees, right? Florida weather, yeah. just, just being in that spot. And I think one of the reasons why I wanted to do this podcast was not just is there an opportunity to get more men into yoga, but I just think a lot of guys, especially in midlife, 40s or 50s, your body's starting to have more challenges. You can't yeah. quite do all, you, you still do, can do a lot, but you're just starting to realize you don't have the energy. You just, your knees aren't the way, your back. And having a drink or having a smoke or just checking out and not responding to anyone th- those aren't really healthy habits to probably to embrace. And I think yoga is something that it can be a foundation for other better habits. Like if you do a lot of yoga, you have to drink a lot of water. Like you cannot have seven coffees, go to yoga and then have a scotch afterwards. Just your body, especially at our age, you're going to find out pretty fast that it doesn't work. You can't eat as much either. You got to eat a lighter diet. A lighter diet. Yeah. And lighter diet, more greens, and pretty soon your taste buds, like you just don't kind of covet the the sort of super savory or sweet foods. Like you just kind of like, things just healthier things taste better. And so I think it moves you into that direction. So if it helps you with creating a routine in the morning, if it helps you drink more water, if it helps you eat better, if it helps you to be mindful of just like where your thoughts are at, I just think the second half of life can go a lot easier. And maybe in your 60s or 70s, you're the Johnny Lama because you've been doing yoga for 30 or 40 years and you're in a great place. Like you accept the fact that you don't run as fast as you used to or can't run at all. But at least your body and mind is in a great place because you've been doing some of these good habits and practices for so long. Well, I'll tell you this much. So, you know, like I'm 51 now and I'm a big guy, right? Like you remember me, you're seeing me now. Like, I mean, you look the same. It's been 20 years. You look the same. Yeah, no, I can't I, speak I, for I, my I'm hairline, big. but you're doing I'm okay. I'm big. No. So I'm a big guy doing yoga and I've always been that way. But what's interesting is when Like, so I've been playing a lot of tennis and I can move around the court with like a bit of agility and flexibility to the body that others can't. And I I always get a comment or two like, oh, how did you move or how do you bend your knees that way? And it's like each morning I'm doing like you said that 
yoga activates the body. It like yeah. gets you ready. So I've been going down there like 45 minutes before tennis and doing that. And so by the time I start playing, like I'm a little more open, a little more flexible, a little more aware, and, and it helps the game. Last night, I treated myself to a massage. The therapist was doing a stretch with my leg and like a hip opener. And she's like, wow, you're like 95% better than... Now, granted, I'm in Florida in an older population. <laughs> right. You're 95% better than most 90-year-olds. Right? Well, <laughs> and I think, I think she was saying it in general as a compliment, like you're flexible. And you know, afterwards, we had a conversation about flexibility. And I'm like, look at flexibility is the key to life. Like flexibility in your mindset as you approach people, right? Having an open mind, flexibility with the body. Tom Brady is a perfect example of that, right? I think he doesn't call what he does at yoga practice, but the tenants are all there, right? They're all taken from this practice that has existed for thousands of years. And it was just to that point, it's interesting to see. And in my 50s, before we did this, I was telling you like, geez, I'm not ready to do this. Like I'm, I'm not feeling good. I've been stuck inside. We haven't been eating well, haven't been exercising because of COVID. And I feel grateful and blessed that my wife has given me like this month in Florida because you're reconnecting with me. Being able to get outside is like spurring that inspiration around the practice and and the benefits. If you truly want to live, like you said, going in to your later years, a more comfortable, more active, more meaningful existence, yoga can be a big help into doing that. So it's, it's just very cool. Yeah, that's awesome, man. Well, tell you what, so what advice, if you had to kind of pinpoint it down to a few things, what advice would you give to guys who are listening to this podcast who, like I said, don't have a practice, never started, or they did it and they just didn't love it, or they haven't done it in years? What would you tell those guys? Yeah, so the first thing I think of is (laughs) Bikram, and may be unpopular with some people, but he used to say, never too old, never too sick, never too late. And I think it's the truth, right? You can start yoga at any point in your life. And the thing about like, if you had a bad experience, there's so many forms of yoga. It's like anything else. You got to give it a month and try a bunch of different teachers till something sticks with you. But the first thing is, it's like anything, right? Like you got to get off the couch. You got to go to a class. And I do recommend going to a class because there's the environment, there's the teacher, there's so many other benefits that you get out of it and put the fear aside and do what you can in class. Nobody else cares, right? Everybody else is struggling. And and we all know that as we get older, right? Everybody's got their own struggle. And that's the beauty of yoga class because you go in there and everybody has their own struggle in class. There's no perfect yogi. So you just got to show up and give it a shot. And if you're too afraid to go to a class, get a tape and try it at home for a little while. But it is a practice and it's a practice for a reason. If you decide that this is something that you want to try, you got to give it a couple of weeks. Yeah, no, I, I totally agree. And just curious for those who are struggling with addiction or have struggled with addiction in the past, would you have anything more specific you tell them about the physical, mental, or the spiritual benefits of yoga? Yeah, I mean, so when you think of the 12 steps, step 11 is all about spiritual practice and mindfulness. And this fits right into that overall tenet of recovery. So for the person who's got the active mind, who wants something a bit more physical than yoga, is is something I'd recommend highly. And one of the other pieces, I did love Bikram because there was this like essence of where I felt the heat. So whether it's Bikram or some other type of heated studio or warm studio, especially for a male who might be a little bit tighter or or bigger, it's a place to allow you to loosen your muscles. But the detoxification, I always felt I was removing years and years of negativity as well as toxins within the body. Now, whether it's true or not, I don't know, but it felt that way. And it felt just so freeing to come out of the class. You're just wringing it all out. Exactly. And that can be accomplished in a non-heated class. You know, I've gone to cold studios like where I've used my breath and I've sweat as much as Bikram or like a heated Ashtanga class. So, but I do like the heat in the beginning because until you learn how to really do the breath, 
it can be a nice way to help that beginner move along a little bit. But definitely yeah. not a requirement. Yeah, no, I have learned a lot about the importance of the breath. It wasn't there in the first probably decade of my practice, but in the last few years, 100%. I think the breath just does so much to connect on all those levels. So couldn't agree more. Well, Tom, hey, first of all, thanks for joining this podcast and supporting me and getting this out the door. But more importantly, thank you for getting me into yoga back in Cambridge 20 years ago. Because if I didn't have this practice, I'm not sure I would be as able to survive some of the challenges and setbacks that I've had in my life and ultimately getting certified and trying to help more other people in using yoga to improve the quality of their lives. So this really goes back to you. And so thank you again on a lot of levels. Yeah, namaste. This has been awesome and it's been great to reconnect and obviously wish you the best. Awesome. Thanks, Tom. Thanks for joining us. Thank you.